So. In the middle. In the middle. Um, slight apologies for a slightly late start. Uh, thank you very much for coming out on this first autumnal day. Uh, the proof that uh, we actually do live in England, however it's been feeling like for the last four or five months. We're here this evening for, at the uh, Royal Society for a discussion on uh, crime, gangs and the changing faces of conflict. I want to tell you a couple of housekeeping things first. Then I am going to introduce the topic a bit and then I'm going to introduce our panel and then we're going to get really moving. The housekeeping things are that mobile phones please turn uh, to at least silent. Uh, we want to uh, the outside world and see what's happening here, but at least silent so as not to interrupt other people. We have had to pay the, uh, the ultimate price and actually switch our phones off the, um, the, the, the disruptive sound. So if you do hear that annoying beep, 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 beep that sometimes comes, then it's the fault of one of those three because I've got my phone off, I swear. Uh, there's no plan. The um, fire drill, so if um, fire alarms sound or someone comes in shouting in a panicked way and so on, we head straight for the uh, which is through that door there. There's a, uh, a wide row in the seats or an arm, and you'll see it easily. Um, and we go outside through that way. That's all of uh, the housekeeping, so that waves dramatically. No, it's all fine. Okay. Um, so the, the topic this evening. Crime, gangs, and the changing face of conflict is a peace position, such as international alert, getting involved in thinking about this topic. Many development and peace building organizations are beginning to think about it. Um, three years ago, the World Bank produced a report about um, development, conflict, and peace, and produced one of those kind of statements that everybody quotes. And because the World Bank said it, we presume that it's really, really a fact. Probably an indication in the right direction that 1.5 billion people live in countries that are under the threat of large scale and organized violence of one kind or another. Not just the countries which are at war, but also from political violence, criminal violence, urban gangs, um, transnational organized crime, trafficking gangs, and so on. 1.5 billion, um, somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of the world's population at the current time. So the world has been making a lot of progress in bringing armed conflicts to an end. Uh, compared to 50 armed conflicts in 1990, there were 32 going last year. On despite Syria, despite the horrors that we see in the newspapers, armed conflicts are on average shorter and less lethal now than they were years ago, 30, 40, or 50 years ago. There are more peace agreements than ever in the last go. Than so in all of these ways, the zone of peace has actually but one of the, the black spots in it is that nonetheless the security and the safety of ordinary people hasn't been improving as markedly as the statistics about war suggest it might do. So that's led us and others like us and the World Bank as well into looking at that next stage of uh, that next level of violence, the violence which we often think of as being more criminal than anything else. We started to unpack what does that really mean and what are the dynamics there. And we're looking at this um, primarily because we're an international peace building organization. International Alert is looking at this at an international level, looking at it in many other countries. But it, of course it also has resonance for what's happening in the UK. In a sense, everywhere that this is happening, you could say internationally from our perspective, is domestic from the perspective of people who are there. And it seems as if there is a lot to learn, a lot to exchange, a lot to understand. Now, on the panel to help us uh, this, uh, starting at the far end, which is where this issue of peace building and the ending of civil wars, how peace gets built. Uh, next to her 
is Junior Smart, and Junior has a different background and a different set of cred credentials. He was a gang member, and still running SOS, which is the largest, um, it is the largest, yes, yeah. help for offenders, for rehabilitating offenders so that they don't repeat offend. Um, it's London-based, uh, and Junior has been working on this for, for several years. And next to me uh, is, uh, is Rabia Nusrat, who was our Pakistan country uh, manager and is now a South and Southeast Asian advisor to us, leading a lot of our work in the region. And I'm going to be drawing on her experience in Pakistan and looking at the, um, the, the way that these problems look there. So you've got three kind of different perspectives uh, on, on the panel. As you know, if you have been to one of these um, events before, these peace structures, there's just questions and discussion. And after a couple of laps around the uh, panel, I'm going to um, ask you, the audience, to start asking questions and expressing opinions and um, a really good co conversation going. We go until about um, 8.30 if I can manage to keep my eye on the clock. The time usually goes much too quickly. And at the end, then, we'll go through some, some nibbles and chat to each other some more. One thing I want to suggest to you, if you're thinking asking a question or expressing a point of view. Odd law of nature conversations like this. Right? They always go further at the end than they do at the beginning. So when I first turn to the audience and I say, you know, would anybody like to make, uh, make a, put a question, express a point of view? Hands you know, kind of creep up. Nobody likes to be first. Right. After about four or five, there's a forest of hands going up. We've got 10 minutes left, and there's 20 people, all of whom want to speak. We, we get more people in and more points of view and more diversity in the conversation. So just think about that if you, if you do want to contribute. Contribute early, uh, and then the, the, the meeting will balance out, uh, the discussion will balance out. Having set the scene as best I could in terms of what our concerns are, what our interests are, how we um, Kick us off with some thoughts, if you would, about that period after a peace agreement gets signed. Let's, whether you want to take you know, uh, an actual case, I don't know, like Liberia or Burundi, um, a possible case like Colombia, um, or just an imaginary case, that period after the peace agreement gets signed, why, why does the issue of criminality and how does it get addressed? Okay. Um, I think a good place to start would be to take that back, actually, to still the, con the context of conflict, um, because really the nature of war has changed quite significantly since the Cold War ended, um, without the support of the two major superpowers, armed groups, whether state or non-state, and efforts. And often this has resulted in criminal activity. Um, and so some examples in West Africa, we saw a on diamond smoke. Liberia and Sierra Leone, um, and but many other wars in the last ten or twenty years has relied quite heavily on some form of illicit trade to to finance the war effort. Um, this creates challenges for the transition from war to peace because what we would normally think of as, um, while not an easy transition, um, a transition to peace changes. So we've got a war economy that's financed by criminal activity, and the people who are engaged in this don't really want to let this go because it's making money for them. So we see a shift from a war economy into a criminal economy, which creates challenges for this after the peace agreement has been signed, um, because you've got a lot of people engaged in illicit activity still. Um, the post-war period also creates particular, I guess, a conducive environment for illicit activity. The government doesn't really have capacity to um, pursue individuals that are involved in criminal activity. There's high levels of unemployment, economic activity going on, so individuals are often driven to criminal activity just out of need um, or pursuing opportunity. Um, but also it's not a priority of the international actors in the initial, um, say, post-conflict reconstruction stabilisation phase. It's more the economy back on track, um, reinstituting governance and focusing on organized crime and illicit activity is seen as we'll deal with this once we've got stability in place. Um, and yet by the time we 
it's, it's very much entrenched. So you've got criminals. And so then they have an interest in keeping it going as well. So by the time it becomes a priority for, um, say, international actors, it is very much entrenched, and so it's much harder to deal with. Well, you said, you said something like, by the time they get to that, they you know, wait for stability to come and then deal with the problem of crime. And by the time they get to that, but it sounds actually as if, if you don't address it early, you may well not get to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So this is a, this is a, a a problem which starts from the economy of the war, mm -hmm. generates a form of behaviour that's committed to this kind this way of making money, this way of looking after their livelihoods. Also, you've got a gun, so you've got respect. So it's also a way of looking after your identity, in a way. It becomes habitual. Why on earth can does not see that you have to break that or break into that at the earliest opportunity. How on earth can, you th can anyone think that this is something that we could deal with the year after next? I think there's two factors at play there. There's the immediate response is, okay, we need to put it that's our priority, um, and everything else really is put on the back burner. Um, but also, and I think this is where we're at now, because we are seeing a growing acknowledgement that this is a problem, um, we just but, um, so we keep falling back on traditional strategies. So capacity building of law enforcement is, is a common response to criminal activity. And yet that's not necessarily going to be a problem because you could be creating better criminals by um, giving them the skills to facilitate their trade more easily. Um, you could be tipping, tipping law enforcement off to, oh, this is a potential money earner for me if I can help facilitate some illicit trade. So I think this is the big issue. We just don't know what to do about it. And there is, I think, the beginning. Well, there's quite a lot of people thinking about this right now. Um, so, um, and so this here for in particular, so bringing a peace building lens to issues such as this is quite interesting because it's looking at um, the context of criminal activity in the post-conflict period as it is. So dealing with the local context and trying to engage with some of the underlying factors that actually facilitate Okay, so let's kind of let's kind of grab that point. We, we, the international community, doesn't know what to do, and is casting around to try and find things to do, because at the moment the best thing is try to enhance the capacity of the police force, and if the police are part of the problem, which in many places they are, mm -hmm. then you're actually making your the cure is worse than the disease, right? So moving along, junior, in SO, what do you do? What do we do? Um, SOS is a complete, holistic, tailor-made support system, which um, basically, it, there's two sides to it. So there's the first side, which is that um, the project is ex-offender-led. So develop, uh, train, um, educate, and you know, um, build the real skills within ex-offenders so that they can provide support to other people going through um, you know, the similar situation to themselves or their previous, you know, our choices. The, the, the key issue there is that um, it's not just any ex-offender or offenders with goodwill. We're looking for the really the best of the best um, of those that are determined to turn their lives that have got unique life experiences that, you know, and the qualifications they can get with us are, you know, real qualifications, level three, in information advice and guidance, chief work. Many of us have gone on to achieve other qualifications such as degrees, etc. Um, so that's part of it. And then the second part of it is actually providing support to that individual. So we do it in both a personal way. Practical is getting that offender um, that gang member that of any statutory service. And our, our belief is that if, you know, if the field is kind of like leveled in terms mm -hmm. of the adversities, the opportunities that they may not face and they're given to overcome the challenges, then they'll desist from the offending. Um, and then the second side of it is really that personal support. So that support from someone who's been there knows what the reality is um, and is best placed to help and support right. them. Okay, well, I've got two questions, two very different questions. Mm. And one of them I'm asking sort of on behalf of people who are not at this meeting. Mm. I mean, holistic, uh, complete, and also tailor-made mm. and personal individual. 
Isn't it very kind of you know labour intensive and also expensive? Absolutely, absolutely. Then that's one of the reasons why our project has been so successful, because um, typically most services, statutory support services, they are limited um, by you know funding cuts and whatever else, and they are limited even for example by the time, but the time mm -hmm. is limited by time bound. They can only work with an offender for a certain period of time, six months, seven months even but the key thing about um, the project uh, you know the fact that we're under a charity is that we can actually have that self-assurance and say that for as long as we're funded our service can continue to be open to that young person who's in need and why is that important well the reality is is that people can will engage and disengage with services as they see fit you know the young people we're working with those that are involved in in gang negative lifestyle choices they come from very complex backgrounds and they've got very intrinsic set of needs and to just actually simply say all right then here's a service that runs nine to five or here's a service that runs monday to friday or here's a service that's only going to work with you for six months it's just not going to meet their needs therefore it needs to be holistic it needs to have the client at the center of, of, of the solution well, we prov our service that we provide, um, as long as we're funded, um, we'll continue to work with that person, but we work on an um, scale. So we're working with a, a person, um, a young person, and um, over time, the idea is to empower them to make changes rather than to be, you know, their crutch sure. to continually they can return back to. So. When I asked the question, I think you didn't hear the second part of it. I said that it was, wasn't it very... Yes. which you've answered yeah and i also said isn't it very expensive in terms of um the cost per person for our service is actually very it's, it's actually quite cheap it works out around three thousand five hundred to about four thousand uh, pounds for a, a, every young person that comes for our service um and you know in um in terms of our reoffending rates for the young people we're working with they're actually quite low right I mean, reoffending for young people, mm. the national figure is about 75. Right? right, yeah. And so if you can bring that figure down, mm. then just from the point of view of saving money. Yeah. How much is it for a person to cover a person in prison for a year? OK, well, the last, last hearing I was at, which was at the public policy exchange, it, it stood at around 99,000 for someone in a secure training centre and 77,000 for someone in a prison estate. Or three or 4,000 if SOS is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. The second question that I wanted to ask, the sec second question was, why did you decide to do this? What, where did that come from in you? OK, it's, it sounds a bit mad, actually, but it was actually the most, uh, probably the most unselfish time of, of my life, really. I was in custody. Um, I got sent down for um, and in that time I saw the sa uh, a lot of young people just coming back in prison again and again and you know unfortunately well fortunately I, I read a book from start to finish it just so happened to to be talking about when absolutely everything is lost be the absolute change that you want to see in and it made me think about actually how um, in terms of helping other people mm. turn their lives around and that led to me being trained first by the Samaritans and that led to me having a look at a larger model that works with offenders and then that led me to St Giles Trust one of the few organisations that would give me a chance and see past record and, and, and the rest as they say is, is history. Yeah, incredible story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us as well. I didn't tell you beforehand that I was going to. <laughs> it just occurred to me to know where does someone start. It's a wonderful Crazy. thing. I want to move on to to Rabia. We've been doing some work. You've been on on two cities in Pakistan, uh, and uh, Rahin yeah. right. and looking at crime issues and street crime there. Initially, yes. Yeah. And that sort of, as I understand it, that's led you in a way going beyond the, the individual and to think about the yeah. framework yeah. of it. Yeah. So tell, tell us something about that as well. Yes, I think we started, um, we were quite interested in looking at um, urban violence and the uh, crime and links to violence in an urban space in Pakistan. But till now, whatever has been, usually Karachi is what everyone picks out to study. But Karachi is a very complex and very 
sort of different dynamics as compared to some other uh, urban centers. So we went on to look at two urban centers in Punjab, Gujarat. It was very interesting because we started by looking at street crimes in these two cities. And um, when the research team went out, they came back a week later saying that people are saying there are no street crimes <laughs> in these two cities, uh, which we sort of made us think back that, okay, maybe we need to look at the overall picture within these cities. But um, before I move on to sort of details within two cities, I think it was, it was very, very quickly find out, we very quickly found out that how the level of tolerance or normalization towards street crime has gone up within these cities. So if your mobile is snatched, the, the, the person who snatched it will go and sell it, and you'll go to the other shop. Actually, he's like, if my mobile gets stolen, I will go and buy a new one, and the person will go and send. So because it's not worth going to the police and following up that. They were like, it's just such a cumbersome process that we When we started looking at that, this is an interesting city because feuds are quite common in lots of urban centers in Pakistan. Uh, family feuds have been going on for a lot of uh, years. Uh, a lot of population has moved abroad, um, uh, so they have invested a lot, so that creates a lot of problem in terms of, again, profit, personal property rights. But what came out, what was the most interesting finding in Gujarat was that this one um, tehsil uh, has has is housed to a drug mafia. So there are two families which have been for years and generations have been involved in drug business. Uh, the, they and and because of because of the control of the drug business, they gone between them. Police has also in the past supported them. Uh, and then there's a lot of the money, so they get involved in other kind of crimes. But also um, then the then the drug mafia also um, has gone on to uh, to um, to kidnap business people, particularly people from the transportation uh, business, uh, and how that extortion has sort of uh, led, been involved in extortion and, and ransom money. Um, interesting to us, families who have been involved in this, and their sort of police has been supporting them. Then we went on to look at the other city, Rahim Yar Khan, which also proved to be uh, extremely interesting, because the certain part of Punjab, um, as it is, is known as the recruitment for a lot of uh, militants. Uh, it's a very, very underdeveloped area uh, with very low socioeconomic indicators, and uh, a lot of uh, sectarianism particularly has stemmed out uh, from, from these areas. Rahim Yah Khan uh, issues came up in Rahim Yah Khan, where there was um, a lot of uh, property issues, um, um, uh, people involved in street crimes. But what, again, the sort of the most that came out from the city was that there's a there's a river that flows um, next to the city, and there are small islands uh, within that river, and they're uninhabited places because no one wants to go and live there. So they have been housed now been housed by criminals, and those criminals operate in a lot of industrial cities in the nearby vicinity. Which uh, the other interesting fact about this is that it shares a border with Balochistan and Sindh, so two other provinces, which means. If there's an action against uh, any of the criminals, they're easily able to escape into the other province, and the police doesn't have jurisdiction in the other province. So a lot of mobility is going on uh, between them. So that we found, and and, the, and then it was, and then it was also very interesting because there were two type of um, gangs f uh, that came out uh, sort of initial research. One was gangs where a family, it's been a family business, but the other way criminals have gotten together to form gangs, um, uh, form gangs, and how different gang and how gangs have created their geographic needs, but also who's doing um, street crimes, who's involved in extortion, who's involved in other kind of businesses. But then there's a lot of interlinkages and profit sharing between these gangs. So if I, for example, I'm a smaller gang, gang kidnap someone, if that's a high value commodity. I will sell it to another gang, and then that will get sold to another gang. So because I don't have the capacity to negotiate mm -hmm. with them, then police's involvement um, came out uh, also and sort of quite clear. We began to realize, which I think has been sort of the problem, uh, so, sort of come up a lot in Pakistan, is how the police's hands is also tied, not just because of their capacity, but because of the political interference. And unfortunately, in some cases, um, police officers who really want to their last resort is to do encounters, to do operations, and that, they say, is the only way to deal with these criminals. What kind of operations? Uh, encounters, so you just shoot, we just basically shot them. Um, but then, uh, and, and then, according to them, after that, all the gangs were disbanded, and they, um, you know, the, the, city, the city is now uh, free of crime. But then, after this, this research ended, my interest sort of continued. So we sort of went on and then found an ex-gang member and spoke to them, and then uh, sort of talked more about um, the parents' bit of it. So it was quite interesting that he, 
a lot of the a lot of these gangs are actually formed by the politicians themselves and pick the people uh, initially um, either because they want to um, they want to settle some score against their political opponents uh, all all the exploit people because there's some internal at the very local level they help one party and then they exploit those people and young people because of poverty are easily sort of drawn into it um, uh, and then and he also and it was very clear to him and then another police guy also became very clear that they were calling very successful wasn't really successful because the, they gave ample warning to all of these gangs and they basically have located their uh, nearby districts and are operating from there so, yeah. so what you a crime politics yeah. and business yeah. intersection yeah and the polit the, there's a political cover being yeah. provided in fact more than that in some cases the gangs are in a sense started politically yeah. do they take part in politics like do they become the politician street enforcers when elections uh, come around or are they as you know as it happens in some countries i mean jamaica obviously but others as well or or as, is there a separation between criminal business and political business in that? I think they do, right. um, uh, particularly in this case. But, um, but I think um, because now there's been this interest in this topic, we went around speaking to a couple of other people and actually uh, spoke to someone who got kidnapped in uh, an NGO work in interior sin. And according to his experience, the, villi the, the, the inner, in, inner sin is uh, the, the local feudal lord is usually also the local politician. <laughs> And all the village houses there, they basically are doing some kind of kidnapping and into that business, but they're supporting the politician. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting, they said that as election comes uh, closer, then that fund is, that's basically one way of fundraising these political parties. Okay. So, <laughs> so, Sasha, back to this question of crime and peace, or, or as in, in our new report, crime and, crime and conflict. We're trying, what the argument of this report is, is that there is certainly something for us in the field to be learning about the issues that we're dealing with and about the threats to peace and stability by <coughs> studying, by looking at, researching, analyzing what is normally called criminal activity and seen as being in a different compartment in the way that Rabia has just been saying. Mm -hmm. but that the peace building lens other ideas for what can be what can be done about the criminal side of, of I mean do you feel that there's enough there yet to be saying practical things that we could be thinking about or do you think we're we're way short of that I think there's the beginnings um, of a sense of what needs to be done so there's a clear shift away from a pure security approach um, where it might be say a direct intervention of okay we're going to go and do something about these criminal groups um, and then and then withdraw so from an international perspective um, there is still this focus on law enforcement um, but we are beginning to see a shift to engage with other elements so um, particularly development aspects. So unemployment has come up um, across all of the all of the presentations um, as quite a significant issue. But this is a very long-term strategy. It's not going to be solved in the short term. Um, so I think we there is still space for more thinking about what what can be done. Um, a lot of the a lot of UN missions now in post-conflict countries are starting to have a focus on organised. Activity, but it does still tend to, fo to fall to, um, say, policing um, units rather than it being more holistic. Might be getting there in, in theoretical terms or our understanding of how mm -hmm. to respond to criminal activity in terms of actually implementing that. We're still, we're still a long ways off. Um, some of the development actors are starting to get more involved in this particularly different said um, They're factoring this in and working in partnership with, say, some of the more law enforcement um, We've seen this before with security sector reform um, programs, but I think now we're moving into different different phases. So, um, DFID in Nigeria, which isn't a post-conflict country, um, but still has quite a significant presence of crime and illicit activity, um, and has Boko Haram. So, I mean, it has yes, yeah, yes, um, multiple sources of instability. So, DFID has been working with um, local NGOs and organisations to do insecurity mapping understand exactly what is at stake um, from a local perspective and what, mm -hmm. what strategies could be developed on the basis of that. So I think that's an interesting, an interesting way to go. 
And Rabia, in terms of the, the work that you were doing in looking at these cities in Pakistan, did you start to come towards ways that you thought it was possible to be addressing these questions or did it, are, are we sure to figure, we're beginning to figure out the problem but still short of figuring out what uh, a solution could be? Yes, I think we're, we're just beginning to figure out um, the problem at the moment because what also happens is that a very sort of linear line of thinking is taken when people are trying to address this problem. Okay, so there's there's unemployment, that means youth is um, is getting engaged in crime. There's a lack of education, so youth are engaged in a, a lot of sort of now um, thinking is starting to come up in Pakistan, particularly in terms of youth getting in, involved in um, in criminal activities, but also when you're looking at military sort of religious extremism, the, the education system is not equipping you to do that. But also the solutions that you're providing, for example, vocational training is sort of a very common solution that is being mm -hmm. provided in developing countries. But if you look at the inflation rate, the cost of living, what I'm going to get, I'm going to become a plumber, is very, very different to what I, what the kind of money that I'll earn if I become a, 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 what they call, they call um, guns on bikes or something like that, people who are sort of rented out to go. So it's those kinds of um, sort of, you know, things that need to be looked at. Then in Pakistan, a lot of um, economic activity is by the small and medium enterprises. But because of the conflict that's going on in the city, they're either relocating to other mm -hmm. cities or they're relocating out of Pakistan. So then even if you're training these people, then where are, where are the jobs? The right. jobs are going away. So it's it's sort of a lot more complex than, than how it's thought about in terms of giving education or sort of doing vocational training, simple programs. So that's a clue for when we <laughs> out with an involved audience in a moment. Anybody who's got some good ideas, there is a real shortage of them at the moment and not stupid to, to be considered. Sasha, to your knowledge, has anybody considered the that um, Junior is doing, you know, translated into different environments? different places? Um, not directly. Um, so I think perhaps because of the in that you're doing it with so many more people and um, that you don't have the time mm. or perhaps the resources to perhaps to do the work to um, to move people on into different into different um, say to have a different focus. Um, but there's definitely programs designed to train people in other areas. And but I think Rabia's comment is is spot on in that they need to see that it's of the same value mm. otherwise it's not going to be um so um in in west africa so it's, um a lot of switching from growing rice to growing marijuana um, and it, it gets them 10 times the income as it would from rice mm. so it's hard to yes rice is the way to go when um, marijuana grows much faster, it's easier to harvest, um, and they get much more for it. Yeah, years ago I saw a study that um, showed a kind of a really, yes, a really shiver-making correlation between world coffee prices and uh, production in, uh, in Colombia. Uh, that as well as slump, cocoa production goes up. It's just, um, you know, re replacing the income. Junior, have, have you thought about Work in an international context? Yeah, I have um, quite a few times. I think um, there's, firstly, from my own studies, there was a lot of stuff around gangs. They tend to, uh, this country tends to look at America and go on the Euro gang uh, definition of gangs, and I personally disagree with that. Other countries and other contexts, you're looking at completely graphics, deprivation index, laws even, especially in America, laws are completely different. And for that very same reason, I think that St Giles and, and SOS just um, can't be transplanted into another country just like that. I think what, what I've always done, each area's got its own intrinsic issues. And then what we do is that we build the project from the ground level up, working with the young people at the front line and looking at what they consider to be the needs. Because again, I, the last thing I'd ever want to do is come up with prescriptive methods. Mm -hmm. I think that's the SOS is such a value, valued alternative to what's out there because we're not the same as the prescriptive methods. Mm. And so we have to avoid stepping into that trap as well. As much as you know, the might be there, 
my main, my main intention is to come up with a long-term solution mm. rather than a short-term one. Let, let me ask you one, one question because mm. um, a lot of, um, for example, there are plenty of programs and have been over the past, what, 15, 20 years uh, dealing with ex-combatants, mm. right? Um, and usually in DDR, disarmament, demobilization and reintegration. And a lot of the approach to uh, relating to um, ex-combatants and helping them to think about operating or working in a peaceful environment has basically been about a, t a skill, a trade, a job, something to do. It has been about them being potentially damaged and traumatized individuals. Mm -hmm. right. So from your, from your perspective, I mean, the, does SOS work on people's skills? Does it work on people's feelings? Does it yeah. work on their pride? What are you, in your tailored approaches, what are you mm. tending to go after with the individuals with whom you're working? Um, whatever it is, we're dealing with vulnerable young people and um, if all the gangs that we've, gang members that we've worked with, they've all been recruited um, through different based on different vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. So for us as, as caseworkers, the aim is to find out what those needs are and to support them and to help them reevaluate that, slow the situation down and have it look at it. For some young people, it might be about actually need that emotional need um, or that, um, you know, the financial need with actually long-term st stable employment, education, um, accreditation, uh, apprenticeships or whatever that need might be. But for, you know what I'm really... The thing that I'm really touched by all the time is that we're really lucky that we aren't seeing more mental health issues in, in this group, purely because I think it's something that many adults take for granted. And we're talking about young people that often um, are victims as well as they are mm. that have to live in the same environment where the perpetrator lives, that often have got complex issues around, for, for example, family care, health care, sexual, sexual health, all of that. Or, you know, we take into the fact that they may have seen their best friend stabbed, robbed, shot. You know, they're living in an area of high deprivation. I've seen some adults that the messy relationship, the messy divorce, and or whatever else, and they struggle to cope. Yet we expect, you know, that's all right. The kids just growing up in this negative neighbourhood. They're making negative lifestyle choices. It can't be a mental health issue. Mm. Yet we know for a fact, you know, around 60 to 70 percent of most of the young people on the gang's matrix in London have got a diagnosed or undiagnosed mental health. Mm. And it's something that we can't ignore, something that we have to help that young person look at and, um, and support them through the process. Let's um, out now for some questions and comments from the... Remember my point at the beginning? Um, if there's 20 of you going to put up your hands, all put up your hands now. It didn't work. Um, Partly, yes. Microphone coming to you. Hi there. Um, thank you all for a really interesting discussion. Um, so is the takeaway from, from this, forgive the horrible slide, um, that gangs often yeah. institutions, that they fill a vacuum where <coughs> state institutions are perhaps failing their citizens? Is that something that you think is Sasha? reasonable? Um, that's definitely one of the issues. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call them gangs, and just because what we're seeing in terms of organised criminal activity is away from something that is necessarily particularly organised and cohesive, um, and it's more of a, a network model, and it's actually more business-like, um, and it's about a transaction of people getting what they need out of it. Um, and so in that sense, I'm not sure that it's, say, a cohesive gang filling a governance vacuum as more individuals taking advantage of a governance vacuum that does exist. But Rabia, part of what you were talking about was that people or groups from that formal institutions are creating gangs or networks mm -hmm. uh, or criminal enterprise where there is no vacuum as such. 
Yes, I think uh, in Pakistan case that some t- saying that um, where there is a vacuum, uh, there are there are sort of out a non-state actors which have come in uh, to take um, to take that space. Uh, sometimes uh, in the form of pure criminal activities. That um, the how the how cities in Pakistan are growing. So there, the area uh, on the periphery, which was one sort of a rural area, is now where taking of a, of an urban space but it's not recognized so there a lot of services are not being provided by the government but there um, uh, other actors have come in to provide those services but that sort of leads to an sometimes leads to an illegal what we call mm-hmm. it, illicit economy so there could also be land related issues waters those are even commodities that are mm. being uh, traded off well that sounds like the sort of the, um, what the question was implying that the government isn't delivering services somebody's going to do something that fills that gap and it slides into uh, what's not sanctioned by law, that's illicit yeah. and criminal. Yeah. And um, the, question, the question of land issues, I mean, how, how does that, how do those play out in criminal, uh, in criminal shape? The sort of the sense of a property mafia or? Yes, yeah, so, there, so there, there are two things to it. One, Pakistan land reforms generally contested topic since the both in the rural setting and in the urban setting. But what happens is that um, there are no formal documentation of these lands, uh, land sort of um, r- records available. Tvari is the, is the local sort of guy who holds all of these documents. Now, it's very easy to for him to exploit people. All he needs to do is, within a map, pick out your piece and give it to someone else. Mm. And then that, invo- that involves um, giving him money and sort of, you know, that's one set of but in terms of in what I sort of spoke to a lot of people um, in, for example, in Lahore, the commercial uh, properties, they are also sort of a source of um, 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 a criminal activity or sort of conflict between, uh, between different parties. There you have property mafias, which reach out to politicians, sometimes um, religious actors to take over sort of certain, um, uh, certain properties. So it sort of works both ways. Okay. Another question? One there, and then there's going to be one there. So hold your hand up again so it can be sure that's it. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the, the role of private security in mm-hmm. sort of post-conflict settings, because I know often there's this sort of an explosion of private security. And lots of DDR programs, quite a lot of people end up working in private security. So what, how do they play into these criminal gangs, and what are the connections, and should how concerned should we be about this? This sort of yeah. Sasha, you got any thoughts about that? I think it differs in different contexts, um, but like any security, there's potential for corruption there. And so, if you, if, depending on who you've got involved, it can act as a protection, a protection scheme for um, people who are involved in criminal activity. And um, I don't want to say that that's across the board how it happens, um, but there's definitely a risk. There. I think there's a, I think there's a distinction well, um, in this kind of whole space. A better word. You're going to have some private uh, companies which are uh, security providers. That's, they're going to do do the security for installations, for business, for UN property, for whatever. Right. And you're going to have others who are providing services for proving security. Companies that in DDR programs or in security sector reform programs. I think the harm which the latter do, very often that they are very business oriented, very results oriented and very time bound. Right? So you, you, d- you deliver the, pro- if you listen to what I was saying about working with individuals right, and doing what's necessary and taking the time that's needed, this would be like another universe compared to how a lot of the providers of security sector reform and programs operate. Um, they have a default mode. You know, here's an agreement, here's a DDR need, here's a program, bim bam, job done, uh, profit margin, same as always. Uh, and I, I have heard government officials of different kinds, both of um, foreign governments in a conflict country and of the, the recovering country, 
about those people as dangerous, right? That they do harm simply because of that's all. But the other ones, the ones who are people, you know, even not in a post-conflict context, um, companies can get into trouble by essentially a whole section of a militia without really knowing that that's what they're doing. But everybody, every local in the area knows precisely who's been hired and knows who they, who they stood for and what they did. And they receive a message out of that. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very bad message. Well, now they've got not only their guns, they've got, they've got some standing and they've got an income that security services, as well as anything that they can get from illicit sources. So I think you make, it, make a distinction between those two different things, but they're both quite, quite muddy and capable of, of, of doing harm. Though, of course, it has also to be said that there are many providers of those services who are trying to act responsibly. Uh, there was a question back there I saw, and then we'll come further down the front. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one thing I suppose I was interested in is sort of um, turning it around slightly, which might be a bit of a tangent, but there's been lots in kind of from the talk and quite understandably what we can learn from sort of the individual projects and working with gang members and offenders in this country and from Gina's experience sort of outwards, you know, mm. and how can we apply that to other models? But I suppose I was sort of thinking and listening, how can we apply our understanding of conflict and state instability and those sorts of models Way, because quite rightly the individual holistic sort of experience of working with young people but I think one of the things that really gets missed is the kind of cultural context certainly in this country we work with the individuals we criminalize young people we see them as the problem and we don't enough you know you talked quite rightly about the complex situations they're in but I suppose um, the class issues I mean young people on estates are getting arrested for drugs when all the middle class kids are doing many, many more drugs. They've got loads more access to the money. They're doing them all. They're never getting arrested. You know, um, role of the state in terms of the police acting as one of the biggest gangs and imposing on a state focus on young people and an inadequate youth justice system against not looking at big organized crime because it's linked in this country just as much to politics, business, big people. But we're criminalizing young people. So I guess what I'm interested in is, is looking the other way. You know, we, we, when we look at other contexts and other cultures, we see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And I think in this country, we're in a stable state every year, the riots, the other situations, and not that we shouldn't learn about how we can work with young people individually, but what we're doing about the system that's creating the problem in the first place. Anybody want to have a crack at that? Um, I do, but I'm holding back. Well, so. I'd, I'd like to comment on the international go, side, but not... Go ahead. Um, but just to pick up on your point about looking at the bigger picture, um, it's really interesting where the drug policy debate is going on this issue. Um, so when you're looking at cases um, in law enforcement, it's often arrests and seizures. Um, and so often law enforcement will go after, say, the low-hanging fruit, so your, your drug mules, your couriers, um, or even drug users. But ultimately, when you're thinking about drug trafficking or the drug trade as a whole, that's not really going to do anything because, um, particularly when we're talking about fragile states, you can arrest 10 couriers on a plane and then the next day there'll be 10 people waiting to take their place because of getting arrested versus, oh, I can make some pounds by um, trafficking a kilogram of cocaine. That's, that's, mm. that's not get at it. Um, but so where the drug policy debate is going with the focus on decriminalisation, although um, it gets bogged down in this debate over whether or not this is promoting drug use, the idea of that is to shift away from targeting the low-level traffickers and drug users up at those who are facilitating the trade. And so I think that's a really interesting approach. Maybe, yeah. Okay, um, Junior, yeah. yeah. I think it's really, really apt that you raised that um, and the only reason why I'm, I'm always cautious about uh, about those very, and they're very obvious issues, I've got to say, is because of fear of people sort of thinking, well, he's just an ex-offender, he's got an axe to grind against the state. That's absolutely not true. We could take the entire map for London, and I, I'm quite happy to bet pages that the gang is from the most impoverished area and the highest level of, of depth. And it's not just in London. I've looked across that and many different maps across the country and it's always the same and the same for the riots. There's very big questions 
about who's the law created by and who's it a while ago where actually, you know, I was saying to a colleague earlier uh, today that me and my sister used to play football on the green and kick the ball up and down the neighbourhood's front lawn and no one would have ever have called the police. But now that's the criminal behaviour. And there's a kind of, there's a slant towards actually um, punitive enforcement measures as opposed to restorative and supportive ones. And here's the, just to finally hammer home the point, None of this is ever not known. So you've got the seven pathways, for example, that the Home Office developed. And they, that talks in great depth about seven which, and the, you know, the causational factors why young people are drawn into criminality. Yet we still approach things with a punitive measure. So this is a very big question and one that I often raise and people kind of go rather quiet to. This is the big elephant in the room, the thing that needs to be addressed, the thing that people need to take on board. If we really want to have long-term changes, the question is, when is it going to happen? When the um, riots happened in uh, August 2011, partly because the street which I live in in Hackney got uh, barricaded off because the next one was... was I kind of took this all quite personally and I, and I you know, read up a lot about what had happened. I watched a lot of those YouTube videos that were going around showing, showing different things. And I also came across a thing called Bezos. Everybody here is familiar with this little bit of jargon out of our field, the yeah. building stability overseas. The United States, uh, for building stability overseas. And I went through it and looked at what it said about the kind of stability that was conducive towards long-term peace <coughs> and the kind of deep issues that created instability and this is of, of instability and types of instability. The more I could see I was reading about Britain. Mm -hmm. right, so we've got a, a building stability overseas strategy but a difficulty, obviously, I mean for obvious reasons about it, a difficulty in turning that lens back onto ourselves. So I think the, 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 the point is a very interesting one and one of the things which I think International Alert has brought, because we've started to work in the UK in the last um, four, four or so years, I think one of the things that brought is that willingness to look at the bigger picture and not regard ourselves as being kind of pushed out if we if we, a lot of groups, I think, are nervous about getting in there because they, they rely a lot on official funding and they're worried about what the Daily Mail would say. And we haven't had that acculturation. We haven't grown up in that way. We've grown up as an organization in a way that says, we're going into Lebanon. What are the issues in Lebanon? Let's think about that. What could we do to help? And so it feels the same if we say, you know, well, we're starting to work in London. What are the issues in London and what, are, what could we do to help? And you necessarily issues which are beyond the reach of an organization like us, but which are there and part of the picture. The other thing though, I just want to sort of emphasize is that one of the things that I've found very interesting as Alert has gone into this field is that when you're thinking about crime it and that sort of dimension of the problem, it becomes easy about that part of the problem or, or the issue also in terms of peace, right? But although, of course, what we're doing is mostly a human concern, actually, to a surprising degree, peace-building programs can leave the individual out of it. And they can deal with ab the abstractions and the large group and the large issues and political representation and marginalization and not deal with how people feel and how people feel and think and the way in which we develop as people is a large part of whether or not a society is the field to be focusing on the general and the abstract. There was a question here and I think in the third row and then one further back. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, this is all really, really interesting. Thanks, uh, thanks for speaking on all these issues. I was wondering just to wheel it back a little bit uh, to the sort of politics and gangs and organized criminal groups, but from all of your perspectives about the legitimacy of these groups in the communities where they work, if they're often the security provider, the justice provider, the person you go to to deal with if you have an issue where the state is absent or maybe the state is seen as more uh, predatory than the gangs and stuff. If we start then 
uh, bringing uh, organized crime into development paradigms, donor paradigms, do we end up, is there a danger of slipping down this road where we say, oh, that's an organized just sort of in the same way that we see some groups, some governments will label groups as terrorist groups, you know, in a very black and white terms. And how do we get around that? Mm. And, and an actors labeling it as corrupt, right? Mm. And, theref and therefore sort of uh, stigmatizing some practices which are perfectly normal and part of the kind of the social stability. Yeah, so there, there's, a, there's an issue there about... Yeah, that in the absence of state responding to people's need, if I, when we've spoken to people, not just because of, for this research, but as we speak to people, policies pretty clearly if I have a problem if I will not go to the government I will go to my local politician I will go to a local leader that's how a lot of these criminal groups um, became uh, militant groups have um, gained sort of power in different in uh, in different sort of uh, areas because there was an absence there was a they people needed mm. some kind of support uh, and so they went to these groups and they provided them what they needed mm. so that's sort of how they they have become legitimate over the years uh, we work we were working on another project and people were, were, were quite frustrated because when the Britons came into Sawat they lost sort of credibility because they couldn't go to the state the state had no solution the local informal justice mechanism couldn't also support them so they were like these both institutions are not working, so then maybe this is a third uh, group mm -hmm. that has come in that we go to and they will uh, respond to our needs. In all the slum areas in, for example, Karachi, um, you get to hear a lot about it, Leari and other gangs, but because they, there's been so much, um, because of various issues within the country, there's been an influx of migrants there. Now, they need basic services and the government is not providing them, someone else is providing them, so they go to those uh, groups. So that's how you buy off loyalty for people. Again, legitimacy. Uh, just to pick up on a separate issue of this naming and the danger of that, um, because I take your point that once you label a group a terrorist group, then all forms of engagement or the potential for, say, um, talks. Um, and it's interesting how that can apply to organised crime groups, particularly in this context, if we're talking um, post-conflict, where they are often provided or even social services because the, there's no other body to do it um, and I, I think you're getting an interesting point that in labeling them a criminal group or organized crime which sounds perhaps a bit more um, a bit worse um, rem that's for good um, because I think the difference between um, being a legitimate positive force is that you're putting into social services, into education, into health, um, whereas I think the motives underlying a lot of criminal activity is profit um, and the desire for power rather than um, the communal good. Um, but if there was a way to, to negotiate and potentially shift that focus um, by meeting both, um, it, it is worth considering whether labelling them as organised crime groups cuts that off. Mm. Junior, does that legitimacy question arise? I mean, is it a... Uh, gangs are still seen as a negative force, and if anything, um, where the, you know, the outer group, the community is affected by it, they're more scared. You know, it's fear that they're talking to us mm. about, and it's fear of reprisals um, from um, uh, gang members if they talk to the police. And there's a certain street to be out there, and, you know, but if you talk to the young people themselves that are involved in it, they're... Their main, their main concern is actually, you know, the to itself, you know, they, they deal with stuff, they don't ever go, you don't ever mm. speak to your authorities. And I just thought it was an interesting parallel with, with two other speakers here in terms of how it's seen because it's, there's certainly no legitimacy either, either whether from the, the gang members or from the community, but there's always this level of fear and, and respect and it, it's quite interesting paradigm mm. I mean there are there are cases that you, you maybe you're sort of alluding to them like the um, the gang leader in uh, Kingston in Jamaica Christopher uh, Coke Dudas he was mm -hmm. known as and when the the police went into a major standoff against him and he was finally he's going to be arrested and he's going to be indicted and he's going to be uh, taken to the US uh, there was a huge community mobilization. The whole thing extremely dangerous and, and, and lethal. And one of, the, 
One of the issues which arose there is that as between government and an insurgent force, where you think it's a, a civil war, even if they hate the insurgent force, will agree there's a humanitarian space where the Red Cross could go in and deal with suffering. They won't do that when it's a criminal force, which is on the other side. So there were people who then who were suffering, who were caught in the middle in the battle between the police and, and Dudas and his group. And there, there wasn't that kind of you know, support for them um, because it was seen in those particular categorical, categorical terms of, of criminal gang. And Dudas himself was seen as being a very legitimate figure by very many people because he had provided social services and, and so on. As indeed many groups that have been named as terrorist groups have an awful lot of local legitimacy because they are seen to do good locally. Uh, there was a one at the back in red shirt, I think. Yes. Hello. Um, I just wanted to make sort of a comment or experience that I faced uh, after a 19-month sentence um, in prison <clears throat> in this country over something very stupid. Uh, in fact, it was for painting graffiti, not related to, to gang violence or anything. Although I have experienced uh, friends of mine being involved in gangs in Mexico, where I grew up. But anyway, that's another story. But um, it's really interesting, the, the, the figures that you mentioned about um, how much it costs to maintain a prisoner <clears throat> in prison. You said something around 70-something thousand a year. I, I thought it was about 40-something thousand when I was in two years ago. But um, it was interesting for me to observe the situation inside prison and, um, and, and find out that um, in the, second, the first prison I was in, I was obviously three hours a day. There's hardly any activities for prisoners. And a lot of them were young, young kids that were, seemed to have lots of potential of people. There was a bit of segregation between black, white, Indian, etc. But I think the the initial experience that I thought I was going to have was that of the, the, the what you see on TV about this um, danger between you know people. But at the end of the day, human beings, and you know, you, so my experience was that I got on with pretty much most people that I encountered. The second prison I was in, which was Brixton, um, it was basically categorised as a decap prison, although it rea in reality it was a, a lock-up prison like any other prison. It, the, the facilities were not suit, uh, fitted for the... the um, what I did see was uh, that kids would <laughs> engage in... ...about how they would, you know, when they were... ...they would talk about, uh, you know, committing crime and blah, blah, blah. Whether they were doing it out of bravado or, or what, I don't know. But I think, yeah, a lot of people that uh, perhaps go to prison and end up in prison. And I think a lot of people knew each other, like you said, when they were going back and forth into prison. The other thing I did see a lot was that um, the open time for people to associate, it was like a casino. Like, there was just like tables to play poker. And I'm not even exaggerating. I think the institutions are there to support people. They don't exploit the potential that people and I was going to see a, a counselor at the time because I, I, I was, it was, for me, to deal with the environment on a daily basis. And um, my way of killing time was through drawing, through exercising. Creativity. And I think every potential, everyone has a potential to exercise their creativity. And person. And various times I said to him, well, I think that the institution is just not providing that for people. And how do they justify 45,000 per? Per uh, prisoner, when what we eat is pretty much crap, mm. and and etc. Um, but um, I think the e the essential element for me was that the penitentiary system is not providing solutions for kids, for you know, 30, 40, 50 year old people, exercise their creative nation and uh, and make them better people, so that when they leave, they can no longer and not go back into that crime mentality. So I mean, it, it was interesting for me to see that that again happens in a country like Britain where you'd think there's, there's more money provided for this system to make use of it to, pro to make prisoners. But it's just the same as, is, as it is in many other places on a, on a lesser degree, but it is still a pattern that is, is there. Sure, sure. I mean, 
prisons as you know training grounds, universities, um, what you learn, people you meet, the networks you make, prepare you for a career in going back to prison. Mm. But that in is partly based on the experience of a couple of friends who also one to Borstal and one to a, to a grown-up prison. It's always been, in a sense, the way that I thought about prisons, that you are, you're a lot of people together, you're giving them an experience together, which will, in some senses, likely unite them. Mm. Um, okay, well, there's, a, there's just a, a couple of key things I wanted to, to mention from what you're saying. Firstly, um, in terms of the, actually it'll be quite interesting to say that the home, that number was correct and the reason why is because the Home Office never, I was quite surprised they hadn't uh, kept into account, what's that, where everything keeps increasing every year, what's the thing inflation. called? Yeah. Inflation. So that, fo the, the amount of money that was, that was actually correct about six years ago and when they now it was actually catastrophic. And you, you imagine 70, um, you know, 75% of offenders actually re-offend. That's money, your money, my money's been wasted, wasted, wasted every year. The second thing about prison is the, the transition. So it's quite interesting. If you see the newspapers, they say, oh, it's a hotel, it's a hotel. Yeah, yeah. You, talk, you know, I've yet, if that's the case, I've yet to stay in a hotel with a toilet bowl, beds. Or, or even another man. Do you know? You know what it's like. It's a, it's an eighteen by six, um, and often in that cell, um, no one's laughing about. No one's joking. Despite the PlayStation, and I think this is part of the issue because when we're talking with young people, and they know that we know what you know, real goals, ambitions. They want the house. Goodness knows they want the mortgage. You know, they want the children, but they're going about it in entirely the wrong way never come across one young person that I can say absolutely you deserve to be in prison you're a waste of time that's never been the case everyone's got transferable skills so that says a lot but if you if you have a look and see what happens when someone's released they're given like a 57 pound discharge warrant that's got they've got to survive on that for up to three weeks before the benefits kick in now any of you survive on 57 pound for three weeks because I couldn't even fill up my car for that amount of money, let alone. And then that all leads to the, to the, the negative cycle. Where does the young people they call up their friends? Uh, if you've got space, can I sleep on your sofa? And they're right back in the centre. Or they start thinking, well, actually, well, I can make some easy money doing what I used to do. Me, if I'd been given a very short sentence to cut my arm, um, a short, sharp sock, I would have come out and I, wouldn't have, I would have probably have gone. I knew, but having received so long, but to acclimatise, and that may that meant I had to make associations in that environment to get through it. Tw you know, twelve years is a you know mm. six years behind the iron curtain, as they say, is a long time, and you have to think about actually, I've got to get through this. I've got to get through the next week of that door being open, and potentially people wanting to walk through the door and and build a name for them. It's very oppressive environment. Um, and I think these are all the sort of key factors we've got to think about when it comes to people that are in custody. Question for that for that account of um, of your time. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, one right over here. And is there one more as well? Or then we'll and then one at the back, um, and then those will be the last two questions. Go ahead. Um, I was working. Yeah. And we were doing some DDR programming there uh, in Mogadishu. And one of the things that kind of goes off what you were just saying was the reintegration. So it was all volunteer at the time. Mm -hmm. And then actually some international community coming into it more often kind of changes it back to like what you were saying with um, time constraints and financial constraints and different priorities and things like that. But what we found was that a lot of the reintegration um, and moving back into the community because you can't really follow people back into the community. They have to begin lives again. But that because there was of Al Shabaab and that they were then removed, um, that they usually would either their life because they thought things were told or something like that, 
or that they um, would fall right back in and go back to back into old ways, despite training, despite mental health mm. um, work, even though it was for shorter periods. Um, but my question would then be, how do you see a way out? Of it? Um, is are there options to for people in these kinds of contexts? What are you doing in London? I, well, you're discussing it, but how does that translate to other places? Sure. And that, thank you very much for that. And then let's take the other question as well and uh, see if it's possible to handle them. Yeah, I just wondered um, to what extent that you think a lack of education versus a lack of opportunity or economic deprivation actually play a greater impact on criminality and to what degree should the international community focus on investments given the resource scarcities? Thank you. Uh, Rabia, start on, start on that one. Because when you were talking about Pakistan, that was, that was an issue which you raised about the education system is educating people, but there isn't opportunity. And so then you can start to think the education is doing more, more harm than, than good. I mean, is, is, there, is there a way out of that kind of that vicious, uh, it's not really a vicious circle, but a, a, a contradiction, a dilemma? Well, I think uh, what also um, everyone is looking for very quick. For example, in the education sector in Pakistan, a lot of money is going into teacher training, teacher training, teacher training. But that teacher training is not going to, to solve the problem. The pro because A, there are very short-term teacher trainings. They're not going to, I mean, these people have come out of the same, for example, system. So it's not like you're going to put them in a room for six days and they will come out and that will wrong. But also there are lots of, um, there are lots of sort of structural issues. So for example, curriculum needs to be updated. It needs to be linked to the market. But then different departments within the government are not talking to each other. Um, you know, wing would have would have released the curriculum while the um, uh, department would still be thinking about what to So there are lots of sort of structural issues. So it's, yes, lots of money is going again into vocational training. A lot of money is going into it. But saturation point, people don't, you, you can't go on producing people who are, who are doing mobile repairs, who are doing refrigeration. You know, that's, you need to study the market first, see what opportunities are there. But on the other side, um, then this is sort of you looking at the, supply side in some ways, but then is someone also looking at the demand side. So when I was talking about the, for example, the SMEs, the small and medium enterprise sector in Pakistan, which is going to be the most, which is going to absorb all of these people, which is going to come out. But there, but there are other sort of issues, there are energy crisis in the country. So that means those industries can't run. So it's, it's, it's just not, you just can't sort of um, uh, think about it in a very simple way that, oh, we're going to uh, invest X amount of money, and DFIT is sort of, Pakistan sort of the biggest um, aid recipients, and most of the money is going to education, but what it's going into, it's going to creating schools and teacher education, but that's not going to solve the problem. You need mm -hmm. to think a bit more holistically as to what is the problem really with the education sector. Mm. To comment and maybe also onto the, the question of the reintegration mm. program. I think both of the questions get at a very similar issue. Um, in terms of how do you move people in, in a different direction. Um, and so the education versus opportunity um, tension in relation to that. And opportunity, I think, is definitely a big, a big issue as well, um, in that you can give people the skills, um, but if, if there's nowhere for them to use them, or if um, what we tend to see is that there's a, we kind of cap, capture a, okay, this is a great strategy, let's train people um, to become mechanics, but then you have too many mechanics. Um, so I think, there's, I guess there's no easy answer, um, but we, we like easy answers, and so we do like to think, um, let's do this one thing and that will be fixed, but really it's, it's something that is going to involve strategies from lots of different um, spheres and so this is particularly talking about conflict affected states because as we've heard um, in the UK things like crime um, and gangs are still a problem so if we're not dealing with issues of say post-conflict reconstruction and reintegrating ex-combatants um, and yet we still have these problems and it's difficult when you've got these other issues as well um, so I think it needs to be part of a much more I know we've talked about holistic strategies quite a lot, um, but I think we do still think about it in terms of specific issues. Um, so rather than it being about skills for employment, 
um, we need to integrate this with, say, um, more economic energy, so bringing investment into the country so that there is more um, so jobs that are actually viable, uh, rather than just, say, a trade that people aren't necessarily going to be able to practice because there's not a need for it. Jane, you're in this thing bet between you know, the, um, the issue of the individual and the, maybe the education, the mm. issue of opportunity, which is the context, context question, mm. the economic context. Mm. Where, where, do, where do you see yourselves and SOS going? You know what, it's, it's been awful. In, in the prisons, they've been taking money out of education. So actually, the most um, qualifications that offenders can achieve whilst they're in custody is a level two qualification, which is actually equivalent to a GCSE. And that means that they've actually got zero opportunity of getting opportunities um, when they're released, purely because, you know, um, most you know, people that are coming out of university can't get a job and they're applying for work. So what chance is someone with a criminal record, with a, a G GCSE equivalent, um, going to get? Taking into account the young person's probably dropped out of education early anyway. This is the thing about which came first, the chicken or the egg. And one of the big issues that we've got, if we can get them the right qualification, is to get them into a job. And for us, what we see on SOS is the obstacle of that person's record. Because what's happened, what happens is, is that the, is we live in a risk-averse society. People are weighing up that criminal record, no matter how minor or how insignificant, as a, a mark against that person's integrity. I can give you a really good example of this. I was working with a young girl just literally months ago, and she wanted to get into a, onto a college course. Yeah? And, but she had disclosed her criminal record, which was drink driving. It wasn't you know, like she's, you know, what they might see as a heinous offence. It was a, a, a crime that happened when she was under the influence. And she had been um, removed immediately. And when I called up, because I, I argued with their head dean, actually, your college, it says on your website you, you promote equal opportunities, and really you're just barring a girl based on a criminal record. He actually had a personal issue. He's, his grandmother had been knocked over by a drink driver, so now that was how he personally took it. So I said to him, well, just give the an interview and if she, she fails the interview, then fine, I, I, I won't take it any further. But at the moment, I think this is discriminative. And um, so they gave her an interview and she aced it. And she's on the course and she's been doing fantastically ever since. But that is one very um, basic example of how that criminal record can inflict. I mean, and that's without the more serious offences. You know, would you employ someone who perhaps um, been involved in DV, perhaps, or theft? You know, all of these some really big questions and if we're going to actually back into the society that we're from because they've committed the crimes but we want them to be society and not carry on then by virtue doesn't that mean that we give them a second chance but how we do that is is the big question mm. and and do we do it by case by case or do we look across um, all offenses that way i think there's a real sort of answer to the question though it's not an easy answer in what Junior was saying because that chance that that girl got is partly because she was being followed up by a mm. caseworker right? and I, I, I think that the difficulty the difficulty of follow-up with whether it's training for reintegration or mm. make it work by themselves that's 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 the, the difficult thing I want to close off this part of the discussion before we go informal and through to the other room by asking each of you if there is one or maybe two things that you want the audience to take away with them. Plucking out of what's been a very rich discussion, we've been in several countries, we've been in several different kinds of crime, we've been at the level of the individual and feelings and we've been at the level of uh, national and international policy. What's the one or two things that you would like people to take away. Um, and you're not allowed to say, well, there's two things, but they each have three categories. It's one or two maximum things. Uh, and about a minute each. Sasha. Okay. Um, so I think we've made clear that we're still a long way from a solution. But I think that discussions like this are really important. 
continuing to move forward in understanding both the problem, but also to start to flesh out um, potential avenues, even starting to look for solutions in particular. Um, the biggest thing is bringing as many different voices into this debate as we can. Um, so the peace building lens is really useful in bringing um, a new perspective to the issue, but we need to be looking further afield to be coming up strategies to respond to um, criminal activity in conflict affected areas. So a certain amount of humility because we haven't got the answer <laughs> and being ready to look in new places for innovative solutions. Junior. Mm. Um, I'd, I'd se definitely second the whole innovative solutions. I think for me if there's one thing I want you all to take away is that actually if you're, you're addressing a problem you can't address the problem in isolation. Young people at the cause of the conflict, um, part of your solution. Um, that's going to be the only way it's really going to work for the long term. Right, so thinking, thinking in a connected way and connected to the human reality. Mm. Rabia. Um, I think the most important point, or probably what worried me most when we were doing this um, work in Pakistan as we continue, is an acceptance towards and that if you put Pakistan in the bigger picture in terms of then community and a society. Okay, so, so it's, it's that, that problem of tolerating what you can't change, which in some ways is a strength that helps make you resilient, yeah. but it just lets the problem get worse right. and worse. And if there's one thing which I would like you all to take away, apart from the feeling that you're passionate, it would probably be a copy of our, our report, Crime and Conflict, which I th goes into these issues it's a very, again, like the evening, it's a very rich discussion with a lot of evidence and cases, research based um, from West Africa and Brazil and in the Philippines. It's looking also on the work that Rabia and others have been doing. So uh, thank you very much for your attendance this uh, evening. in the room at the back um, for, for a drink. And first, before doing that, please thank the panel for... Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. It was really good. Thank you. Open at the back. Find your own way there.